Hi, I'm Lucas Turnblum, creator and writer and artist of Steve L. McEvil, How to Cat, Dream Jumper, and Imagine This. And uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, threads at Lucas Turnblum, uh, or you can go to stevelmcevil.com for all information on Steve L. McEvil. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. You know his work from How to Cat, as well as Steve L. McEvil, and imagine this, Dream Jumper, a bunch of other things I'm sure we'll definitely talk about. He's returning back on to Two Geeks Talking because he is the ever-talented Lucas Turnblum, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a <laughs> tremendous introduction. Well, I've gotten better over the years because I was <laughs> I was looking at our past interviews and you've only been on here once. We were talking about Dream Jumper way back when. It's got to be 2015, 16, something like that. Oh, oh, oh there, there's a good plug there. Yeah, there it Love is. It. Book one. <laughs> it has been forever. How are you doing? I, you know, I'm great. Um, I'm out here in California where it's always warm and uh, we survived the massive hurricane that I'm sure everybody around the earth heard about that was barely a trickle of rain. <laughs> now, I don't want to make light because there were people who were definitely in the path of that thing. But uh, other than that, no, I'm doing great. I'm just doing comics and, and living life as best I can with two uh, very rambunctious teenagers. Um, yeah. Well, I always jump ahead of myself as I do, but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Okay, uh, my name is Lucas Turnblum. I am a cartoonist. I have been a professional cartoonist since the mid-2000s. Uh, a lot of people to this day know me for my first real, uh, I guess, paid web comic called Imagine This, which still runs on gocomics.com. Uh, it's about a, uh, a middle-aged man who lives with his imaginary friend who happens to be a little teddy bear. And if that sounds familiar, no, I did not get any money for that movie. So we'll move on from there. Uh, but then I started working on, um, a few years later, Dream Jumper, a graphic novel with my good friend and actor, Greg Grunberg. And then um, shortly after that, I started How To Cat, which is an exclusive web comic. Uh, I'm sure... If you don't recognize the name, once you if you've seen the I'm sure you've seen the comic somewhere, it's everywhere. And that still runs. And I do that exclusively on my uh social media sites. And then um currently I'm working on the Steve L. McEvil graphic novel series from Random House, uh Crown Books for Young Readers. And I'm super happy with that. And as as we do this interview, I'm currently working on book three, and I'm almost done with the art for that. And uh it should hopefully be out next year. So much to touch on. <laughs> you are just constantly busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes yes absolutely the, when we last talked we were talking about dream jumper one uh it's been a few years since then what is the status of dream jumper and how's greg doing and, and everything like that uh greg's doing well um he um he has uh, three adult boys and they keep him very busy and obviously he's not working right now because of the uh writers and actors uh strike but he's doing fairly well. And um, it's it's been a couple weeks since we've talked. Uh, we have Dream Jumper 3 in the wings. We're just waiting uh, for Scholastic to give us the go-ahead to uh, to actually publish it. Um, so we'll, we have the first two Dream Jumper books, if, for those who are familiar. Dream Jumper 1, A Nightmare Escape. Dream Jumper 2, The Curse of the Harvester. And um, the third book in the trilogy, hopefully, hopefully will be out sometime in the next couple of years. We'll find out. What was that collaborative process like in terms of writing from book one to this current issue right, right here? Because obviously you're a very talented artist and Greg's an amazing writer as well. But what is mm -hmm. that back and forth like from a creative process? Well, I just, fortunately for me, I happen to be fairly close to Los Angeles, which is where Greg is based. I'm in San Diego. So a lot of times when we, when we first began Dream Jumper, um, we would do a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, writing sessions. So um, for those who don't know, I co-wrote the book with Greg. 
And so the first time we we actually kind of got the idea together, uh, he came down to San Diego Comic Con. He was promoting, I think it was Heroes at the time. And we met up there. He was telling me about this idea. I told him, I said, let's get this written down. Let's turn this into a graphic novel. And then um, I believe it was a few weeks later, I drove up to his uh, production studio in Los Angeles and we sat down. He has like separate, like a writing room, a production room, uh, a, a music studio. I mean, it's it's amazing. His, his production <laughs> studio up there is really cool. Uh, but we would sit down in different areas and try to just throw a bunch of ideas at the wall um, in terms of what we wanted in the books. And then when we decided, okay, well, this is, this is how we want to chart this thing out. And then we would kind of just talk back and forth how, how we, how we would think kids would converse with each other to try to get the dialogue down. And then we would run it past our kids and say, Hey, do kids talk like this? And of course they would say no. And then they would help us kind of change the language a little bit, but it was a very, um, we tried to meet in person as much as possible, just because it's it's hard doing it over. Uh, and at the time, this was before Zoom, believe it or not. Uh, it's hard to doing it over the phone. It's hard doing it on, um, uh, you know, instant messenger stuff like that. It's much easier to do it in person. And like I said, fortunately for me, I happen to be, you know, less than a hundred miles away. Even though once you get close to LA, <laughs> like within ten miles. It's like you're 2,000 miles away because traffic is so bad. It's yeah. just awful. So I figured out over the years different ways of getting into Los Angeles to avoid some of that, but not many. You know, you're always going to get stuck in traffic when you go up there. But yes, that's that was the collaborative process, just in person as often as possible. But Dream Jumper Book One, it took many years for us to get that story where we wanted it. It, it was... Um, um, we just wanted to make sure that it was as perfect as we can get it before we even pitched it. So there's actually a version of the book, book one, that's out there that nobody has seen. <laughs> because as perfect as that was, it changed once we sold it to Scholastic. They had um they they guided us a little bit more. They said, okay, well, this we want you to whittle it down. We want you to kind of spread this story out over several books. And so we did. So there's actually a unpublished dream jumper. Uh, somewhere in my office right now. I think it's in that box over there. Um, but it, yeah, so someday I'll put that online and people will see it and be like, wow, because it's almost like, in a way, it's 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 almost like a prequel because it does a lot of setup, um, but which we cut out when we wanted uh, kids to use their own imagination um, in terms of the characters so that they don't have to have it spoon fed to them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's that's really how that that process worked. And then book two was much more condensed because we had a deadline. So it went from being like two or three years for Dream Jumper book one to like six months for two. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, but that that was and that was also done face to face. So wow, I, I just love the collaborative effort because the the ability to bounce ideas off of each other to find a creative groove that you get into, and the fact that you had a younger generation with both of your well, with, with your kids on, on both sides there, uh, giving you the sounding board you needed to kind of hit the right audience or your target audience was pretty amazing in, in that respect. In mm -hmm. terms of Scholastic's uh, improvements on the actual book itself here, what was that like? Because sometimes when you get a, a publisher of, of that regard and that respect, um, they're obviously looking to put out the best book possible. But from a corporate side of things, I, I've never had been in those types of boardrooms. So how was that to those conversations specifically? And did you learn anything from that? Um, well, when it came down to... Um producing the book with Scholastic, they didn't really, there was no, um, I mean, the only thing they told us really was you can't cuss. And we already knew that because, you know, this is an all ages book. And obviously if it ever got to the television, you know, place, they could do whatever they want with it because realistically Hollywood kind of takes the creative freedom away from you. That's just how it works. But that was really the only kind of thing that they told us we couldn't do. Other than that, I mean, we, we pretty much had, you know, free range of what we wanted to write, how we wanted to tell the story. Our editor really kind of helped keep us in pace. He said, you know, he would tell us, look, we don't want this to be like a 400 page book because, you know, kids aren't going to read that. We want to try to get it down as close to 200 pages as possible. So we want to kind of trim the fat. So because a lot of times Greg and I would just go back and forth. We would, you know, just kind of riff, you know, we'd have like these long 
drawn out jokes that a lot of kids do you know like if you ever listen to to like a you know a fifth graders conversation or a sixth graders conversation they'll talk for hours about nothing but it's funny and they, they laugh and everybody around them laughs so we had a lot of moments like that in the book and they were they felt honest and real um but when it comes to producing something for children you got to kind of trim it as much as possible keep the funny there but you got to cut the fat as where you can Right. So and that so that's really what they did for us. They said, okay, no cussing, and we'll help keep it. Uh, I don't want to say succinct, but the, the, they kept us in line in terms of uh, guiding us to where we wanted to go. So what's what is book three all about? If you can kind of give us a bit of a synopsis and a title, if possible. Oh no, no, no. well I can't. Oh, I mean, because okay. it's it's so <laughs> yeah. But basically, well, it wraps up the trilogy. It okay. explains. Uh, you know, it explains where Ben's father is, if he's alive, is if he's dead. Um, it talks about who the Nightmare Lord is. Uh, it, it basically ties all the threads, and it's it's from where we last left it. It's it's actually longer than book two, uh, so it's a good, nice closer. It's just you know, it, you know, it's publishing is very weird right now. I I, I you just never know what's you know, what, what a publisher wants to make right now. I mean, it's, they kind of, you know, they have what they want to do and and what they don't at the moment. And it seems like, you know, the fantasy element kind of went down a little bit and that's not really where they are, but, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll come back to us in a year or two and say, okay, we're ready. Um, because we're ready. We're ready to put it out. So we'll see. Oh, that, that's all right. Then is this going to be the end yeah. of dream jumper? Is this kind of like, are were you, was this going to be a trilogy to begin with or was, are you thinking of doing maybe more with Greg in the future or is three enough? I, I would love to write as many as possible. Um, generally when I write a story, like I did with the Steve L. McEvil series, um, I always write them in threes. So like, it, it's like, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by Star Wars. You can't see it, but I've got Star Wars posters all over this office. And I like how George Lucas did his stories in threes. I mean, you can't count the sequel trilogy because it's not really his, but I mean, he, he did want to write, you know, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. And I just like how each one is, has their, their trilogy. So um, the, the current dream jumper storyline i think would wrap in three and then it would move on to something else with another character um uh, and that's kind of the same thing what i'm doing with steve l mckeeval speaking of steve l mckeeval this is a great segue into your next book it's almost as if you planned this who knew uh, and it's right behind you and and on your lower third <laughs> as well what is steve l mckeeval all about because that is something that we never really you were hinting at it when we last spoke you didn't really touch mm -hmm. on it what is Steve L. McEvil all about? And I want to hear all about it, truly. This is this is the segment of that show now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So Steve L. McEvil, and I have the books here. I'm going to hold them up real quick mm -hmm. for people who can see it. I'm sorry for the, the folks on who are just listening on the audio. Um, but what it's about is it's about a, a child who comes from a long history, family history of supervillains. So um, his grandfather, his great grandfather, his great great grandfather, and so on. They're all supervillains. The funny thing is, is they're not very good at it, but they all think that they are. And the grandfather in the book has the uh, nickname of the world's greatest supervillain. And it's just, it's kind of a very silly, over the top, very Simpsons esque. It's been called Rick and Morty for kids which I love that because I actually came up with the idea and wrote book one before Rick and Morty ever made it to TV. <laughs> it. It's just, that's how long it took to get it into the stores. I mean, publishing just takes forever. So Steve L. McEvil is about this kid who wants to be the supervillain, just like his family, but he stinks at it. So he decides, okay, this year's the year I'm going to become the world's greatest supervillain. And then all of a sudden this mysterious character comes in and stops him at every turn. He always seems to be ahead of him like a superhero kind of stopping these evil plans. And then they have to come together to stop an even greater threat to the earth. And then that's what book one is. And book two kind of takes it from there. And that's just the general thing. It's about a kid who wants to be a supervillain, but he really sucks at it. So. What has been the the fan reaction to Steve L. McEvil, not only from the comic books of comic convention scene, but maybe those that have, have purchased it online and then have seen you at a convention? I'm curious about that type of interaction you've had. 
Well, it's it's kind of tricky when you see, like I I'm not necessarily a brand name. People don't know Lucas Termloom. Oh, he what what does he have now? They know my projects. So I've people know Dream when they hear it, or they'll know how to cat or they'll know Steve L. McEvil, but they don't necessarily put them all three together. Like, oh, that's the one creator who made all this stuff. I'm not quite there yet. So getting one audience to jump to another project, to another project, it's tough, you know? And and I don't blame them. You know, it's when I tell my how-to cat readers, hey, you got to check this book series out. And they're like, well, what's it about? I said, well, it's about a kid supervillain. They're like, oh, well, I like to read cat stuff. And I said, oh, I totally understand that. There's a cat in the book um, and it's very important. It, it's it's tricky. So what I've noticed is, is I have different audiences, which is really kind of cool. So I've got a dream jumper audience. I have an imagine this audience from way back. I've got the how to cat audience, which they just they're just everywhere. And then I've got the the slow building of the Steve L. McEvil. Steve L. McEvil is still fairly new, and it launched right in the middle of COVID, which was the uh-huh. worst. I mean, you ask any author debuting a new series that is the worst time to debut a book <laughs> just because you can't go to the schools you know pro, you know everything i mean the book expo of america had closed i think it's still closed you wow. know i couldn't get out to the american library association stuff now is the time everything's starting to build back up and i'm seeing a lot of my fellow authors going to these different events and i'm like oh, i so desperately want to go but i'm right in the middle of working on this thing <laughs> and so promotion for for uh the mcevil series has just been tough but I have been doing a lot of school visits recently, and I do hear from people online that they, it, the, the great thing is, is it's a, it's a small audience right now, but it's getting bigger. And the I hear from kids that they love the series because it's easy to read, it's full of jokes, and the art really just jumps off the page. And I have to give a shout out to my colorist, Mark LaPierre, because he's brilliant, and his his colors are absolutely stunning and when i pitched this book i told random house i said i have this colorist and i want him to do it because he's really going to make this thing jump off the page and everybody agrees that he makes this book so much better and that's another thing i hear just you know from the kids is the colors are just so just almost mind-bending it's they just pop off the page so um i get a lot of really positive feedback from kids like honest feedback from kids and they all love it. And and book two uh, actually has a cliffhanger ending, which I thought a lot of kids would be mad about the way it ends, but they're not. They're like, they're intrigued. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. What happens in book three? I'm like, okay, well, book three is coming. So just be patient and you'll really like it because the payoff is amazing. Hmm. And so, and the like, you know, good read reviews are fairly positive. All the Amazon reviews are great. So, and you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I mean, when book one came out, I said, Hey, Hey, go leave a five-star review if you like book one, but I haven't really done that so much. And they're, they're, they're still popping up, which, you know, it's, it's more or less organic. People are liking it and they're, they're telling people about it, which is great. And I keep telling my publisher, we'll get there. We'll get there. You know, the audience is building. It's, you know, we're still a COVID book, so we got to get to book three and, you know, once the trilogy is there, everybody's going to see it and they're going to be like, oh, oh, I know what you're doing now. I didn't notice that in book one. And oh, and it all comes together and it makes sense. And um, kids, I think, are really starting to understand that. And uh, it's great. It's a great feeling. Yeah, yeah the, the young audience, the young adult, I should say, uh, readership, I I haven't been a kid in forever. So, so I don't, I don't know about the landscape of the young audience these days when it comes to reading books. And I'm glad that you have Steve L. McEvil and I'm glad that you've been able to showcase this talent. What is it, in your opinion, what is it like for the young audience in today's technological advanced age when it comes to consuming media as well as comics? Well, it's, they, the real issue that creators like myself run into is there's so much available uh, content. I mean, it's uh, you, I mean, one of the, the challenges I have when I do school visits, it's not really a challenge because it's actually a really cool thing that kids have so much choice now. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, it was, you know, superhero comics and that was pretty much it. And I'm not knocking superhero comics because I love superhero comics, but with the, you know, there wasn't, you know, Reina, there wasn't Amulet, 
uh, Bone was still, you know, an independent comic being sold as, you know, the 20 page books at Comic-Con. I mean, all ages graphic novel stuff really just didn't exist when we were kids. And so now they the choice is just amazing. They can read anything at any time from any genre you can possibly think of. But like I said, as a creator, it makes it all the more difficult to try to push your product. So it's like, I go to a school with Steve L. McKeever, I'll say, here, there's my book. And they're like, well, why should we read this book when we've got all these other books over here? And so you really have to kind of put on your salesman pants, so to speak. So I've been learning a lot about salesmanship, which is for an introvert like myself is really difficult, but I mean, you got to do it. And that's the one thing that I never you know, envisioned for myself when I tried to move into this career 15 years ago that I would be a salesman because, you know, back in the olden days when you tried to get into syndicated or like I, how I tried to get into as a syndicated newspaper cartoonist, you know, they had their salesmen, they had their their marketing team, they had their, their, their pitch people and they would go to the different newspapers and all you had to do is sit down and draw. It's not that way anymore. You know, even if you have a major publisher uh, produce a book for you, they do do some marketing for you, but the onus is really on the creator now. And um, for those getting into this field, you have to understand that. And um, one of the other things too is, is, you know, a lot of times I've, I, you know, I've heard this from people that, that there could be resentment towards other creators who are doing well and, and one, you know, for the people who aren't doing so well, but you know, it's, it's, you can't have that attitude because, you just never know what's going to hit. There's literally so much material out there. I have so many friends in this business who are just doing phenomenally well because they hit, they hit the right time with the right material. And that, you know, you just never know. And, and, you know, and some of them are really good salesmen too. <laughs> so I, I, I've got a lot to learn still. So I, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating time to be in this field because it's, the opportunities are immense yeah. and um, it's, it's great for kids too. Like I said, the choice is ever, they have so much to read now and it's wonderful even, you know, and it's not even so much they're competing with online stuff because they read it all, you know, they'll read web tunes or they'll go to go comics and uh, you know, or they'll just go to their library or their, their, their classroom bookshelf. And they've got, you know, a thousand books there, you know, uh, Colby Sharp, a, a librarian, online he's his classroom is just tremendous with he's got just walls of books and i'm i just look at it and be like wow what i wouldn't have given for that growing up um so, sorry what kobe sharp yeah he's a he's a librarian I, I i'm forgetting his uh his handle for online stuff but he does a lot of like instagram videos tiktok videos uh he's a, he's a uh, librarian and I, and a teacher and oh, nice. his classrooms um he he specializes in bringing in lots of different uh graphic novels and picture books and he really he promotes a lot of them online too and he does a lot um a lot of amazing uh stuff with his students in terms of of providing them content that that's what i that's what i loved about uh the libraries you know I, that's how i got engaged in so much content from uh, Dragonlance. That I, if I didn't go to my local library in in high school and I didn't see like the very first issue of Dragonlance, um, I probably wouldn't have been a fantasy reader. <laughs> you know, uh, Star Wars was a huge influence. You know, and and that was even before the books really came out, um, or after the mm -hmm. fact, I should say. James Bond. You had uh, Isaac Asimov. You had a whole bunch of of, of just sci fi and fantasy and amazing books out there just to physically read that you had in your hands and uh, i mean today now it's it, there with the libraries are so underutilized i think but it's great to see that you know like this kobe and like your your local libraries if you haven't visited your library more recently take a look because you have comics you have all of the genres that you that you know and love that you can get easily on your phone but sometimes you want to just sit down have a cup of coffee and read a book yeah. And, you know, the San Diego library system, and I'm sure many other libraries around the country work this way, is if they don't have the book at your local library, they can order it from any of the surrounding libraries or they can get it for you. You know, I mean, and that's the other thing, too, you know, with with everything being so expensive right now, you know, you're really asking people a lot to to go out and purchase your book when they need gas or they need, 
you know, milk or eggs or, you know, food, you know, and so I get it. I totally understand it. And I'm a huge supporter of the libraries. The libraries have always been great to me. And so if you can, if you can get McEvil at a library, you know, more power to you. And like I said, they can always order it. And I've provided, you know, locally, um, to libraries around San Diego. So, um, yeah, I'm a huge supporter of libraries. And like you were saying earlier, uh, it's it's different how libraries were utilized 20 years ago versus now, because uh, like you were saying, I don't know that I would have been a fantasy reader either. I mean, I'm not a huge fantasy reader, but I mean, I never would have discovered Terry Brooks had my library not promoted it when I was walking in there. They had a huge Terry Brooks shelf and then they had the Stephen King shelf. And truth be told, back then we had to read, I think it was like 600 pages every quarter. Wow. To, to, yeah, I mean it's ridiculous, but I mean and they don't make the kids do that now here in San Diego. I happen to know that for a fact, but back then they did. So we would always go right to Stephen King, and if Stephen King was gone, we'd go to Dean Koontz, and if Dean Koontz was gone, and those shelves were always empty, mm-hmm. we would go to you know fantasy books. So I would always go right to Shannara because at that time he had a bunch of books, and and you know th- they were always there on the shelf. So I grab them, and and you know I fell in love with. I still read his stuff today when I I think he just released the last Shannara book uh, a couple years ago, which I haven't read that, but I mean, I I absolutely adore his writing and I I try to incorporate some of his style into what I do too, because he's another one. um, It's, it's changed over the years, but he's another one who would put out trilogies. You know, he, the first, like the, uh, the sword, the elf stones, the wish song, and then he would move on. Um, which I think it was a four part, but then he had a bunch of trilogies after that. So I, I just, I love telling stories in three parts. I mean, well, I, I'm curious, speaking of authors and how they've, how, how they've influenced, I kind of segueing off of your, your response here. What are three writers that you, and you've mentioned this, but kind of the reason why these are influential writers for your writing style three writers that are influential in your writing style and why they're influential. Wow. Let's see. Okay. Um, um, the first one I'm going to, I'm going to throw out there and I haven't really read too meant too much of her, her stuff, but I have read the one, one of her books was, it, it was like almost like life changing to me it was uh, Jane Yolen's uh, dragon blood. Mm-hmm. And, that book I discovered in, I think it was the sixth grade. And again, you know, I was a reluctant reader growing up, but that book has stuck with me because of the fantasy element. There was, it was a very much a story about a, a it was a, a child who was a slave who worked on a dragon farm and his, his job was breeding dragons, but it was in a different part of the galaxy on a planet far, far away where, you know, they still had like gladiator pits where the dragons would fight. And there was something about um, the fantasy element and almost like the star Wars element of that, that, that really grabbed me because star Wars was the biggest creative thing in my life. It still is. And so I'm not going to name George Lucas here just because I think we're more or less talking about books, but I think that whenever I go to books, I always have, that thing in my head is this is this like star wars in some way and uh the dragon blood series definitely was and i believe that there were four books in that series that i think at that time i discovered there were three and then she made like a fourth book many years later but dragons Blood, jane yolen um terry brooks and i know terry brooks because of again the trilogy aspect of his writing the fantasy element it's very much he kind of takes the the you know wizards and dragons thing and kind of turns it on end and creates his own own thing but i think if i remember correctly it's been a few years since i read um uh sword of schnarr i think i believe the whole series takes place actually in the future where it it makes you think it takes place kind of like in the past in the olden days but it actually is way in the future because they encounter machines and all kinds of things that are buried under the dirt um so definitely terry brooks and if i have I want to say more recently, uh, Lee Child. I discovered the um, the Jack Reacher books uh, um, uh, in my obviously in my adult years because they're not that old. But um, my wife's uncle introduced me to them years ago, and I just like 
just the very fast paced style of the mystery and, and just how quickly they move and how, um, I just, I love, I love the way that the mystery books work, how like, you know, you have to come up with the ending first, then you work your way back. And then when you finish the book, you're like, Oh, that was very clever. How they, they strung you along like this. And they threw this little element in over here that you didn't even think about until the end. And, um, just as kind of a, like a side note, uh, um, J.K. Rowling, uh, when I first was introduced to the Harry Potter books in the 90s, uh, that was one of the things I loved about them. Um, I know she's controversial, so uh, you know I won't talk too much about that, but I loved the way she would include details in book one and then come back to it either in book two or book three. And then it threads the threads all come together and you're like, that's amazing how she did that. I wonder if that was planned. It had to have been planned. Yeah. I love, I want to do that too. I want to incorporate those elements into my books. And actually I did in the McEvil series, there's some elements in book three that are going to, uh, that were kind of hinted at in book one, and then you'll understand why they were hinted at. And so I definitely got that from, from Rowling, from uh, Lee Child and, mm -hmm. Definitely the 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 telling stories in three parts comes from Terry Brooks. So that's really good. I didn't know if you needed to take that while we're uh I I just heard heard a ding while you were I heard it. Oh, ding it was my like, phone. Sorry, phone. yeah. No, no, it's it's all right. I just know if that was important or not. So that's all. No, uh, no, no, no. It's it was uh, I think it was uh, a friend of mine went to Tennessee and he was texting. <laughs> Well, get, I'm like, get, I'm like, why are you in Tennessee? It's like, oh, I'm out here drinking. I was gonna say, get some bourbon or something. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> what is your creative kryptonite then? Ooh, well, lately, lately, life has been getting in the way. Just in terms of, you know, my kids are getting older. Um, you know, it's no longer, you know, me planning my schedule accordingly. It's, you know, I've got two young adults who have their own schedules and what ends up happening is, 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 you know, life just gets in the way. And then I sit down on the couch and I'll put my feet up and I'm like, I should be working right now. It's, you know, one in the morning and everybody's finally gone to sleep, but I'm just exhausted. So um, I'm right now life, because in general, up to this point, I have been, you can ask a couple of friends of mine. I'm, I've, when it comes to, this career i've been a workaholic and dealing with young adults now it's it's kind of changed how i work and and i'm trying to adjust it accordingly i've i've discussed it with my editor you know we've got you know some things going on at home right now and i said look i i'm still trying to figure out how to get all this work done you know, with, with life all over the place and I'm starting to adjust and I'm back into my groove and I'm very close to finishing McEvil three. And then, um, you know, once that trilogy wraps, you know, we'll discuss whether or not we're going to do more McEvil books or we're going to move on to another series. Uh, it's looking like another series maybe cause I already have some ideas there that I'm pitching. So, um, yeah. So that, I would say that that's my biggest kryptonite right now is just life in general. <laughs> I'm good. Good thing you didn't say the kids itself are your actual kryptonite. It's it's their schedules are the kryptonite. So that works. It's out. it's. I, I try not to blame <laughs> the kids. I mean, because I was a teenager, I yeah. understand the teenage brain. I understand that you know the littlest thing can be the world, and I get it. And I don't want to be an ogre of a father. And it's like, okay, look, we'll handle this crisis. Let me put my work down. We'll, we'll figure this out. I'll come back to my work later on. My editor, she's wonderful. She is a parent. She totally understands what I'm going through right now. Uh, I have a small group of uh, uh, authors who are parents who I can actually talk to about this because they've been through similar situations with teenagers. And, you know, it's 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 amazing to me, the community that I've I've found doing this. There's some amazing people uh, in cartooning right now. Uh, well, there always have been, but I mean that I've that I've met over the years who've just been supportive and you know, I I would even say mentoring in a way. And and I just I am so grateful for this life that I found. And every day, you know, I get up and as exhausted as I am, I'm just, you know, I just say in my heart how grateful I am for this. I hope it doesn't go away. I'm very happy with this career and and the people that I've met. And yeah, so I mean. 
kryptonite is life. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the young adult genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? Wow. Um, I'm going to say that the most misunderstood, hmm, that graphic novels aren't real books. Hmm. And, you know, I don't really take insult to that because I understand why people say that, but I think that they miss a huge thing with graphic novels is that it gets kids to read. You have to read these books to understand them. Even, even if the dialogue is minimal, you still have to understand because there is a process, a writing process that goes into these things that can be just as painstaking as writing, you know, Jurassic Park, because you're writing the elements of what you're seeing visually on top of the dialogue. And you have to make sure that the story makes sense. So there, they are, they're just, it's more digestible than I would say, you know, a 900 page Stephen King book. And granted, a third grader is not going to read, you know, it, but uh, it's, they're most definitely real books and discouraging children from reading graphic novels is a huge disservice to them because it really is, I don't want, you know, gateway is a terrible way to say it, but it is, it absolutely is because it encourages them once they start understanding how stories are written to maybe go a little deeper to maybe get, you know, go from, let's say, you know, make evil to mouse, you know, mouse is a very dense uh, graphic novel, um, very important. And it's, you know, it's, it's a little more than, than obviously than my fart jokes, <laughs> But, you know, it's still it's still very much a real book. And then they, you know, they go from mouse to, you know, a, a, you know, a bunch of nonfiction works or fiction works, you know, and it's it's definitely a stepping stone or gateway. And it's people the more people understand that and the more people don't discourage their children from bringing home graphic novels, I think the better we will all be um, because it's absolutely real reading real books. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's keep going here. Got a couple more questions or so for you, uh, plus my sure. four introspective and the fifth fun one at the end to wrap everything up. Okay. Uh, am I am I hitting everything you want to talk about just as a quick segue? Am I missing anything? Do you want me to ask you anything? Oh, no. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about How To Cat, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I mean, okay. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people, you know, I mean, I, I'm obviously promoting... Yep. McEvil, but um, no, let, everybody loves How To Cat. So. Let, so let's jump into How To Cat because um, yeah. I, I used to have four cats, and um, <laughs> my my mom <laughs> uh, just loved all of all four to death. I mean, I love three out of the four, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> and so whenever I would show her uh, your comic, How To Cat, she she'd get a little tear in her eye and awe and all this other stuff. So. So you're bringing up emotions in her when she reads the comic as well, too. And I just I love the fact that it's everything you see in that comic is true, literally. Like, I just I just love it to, to death. It's just an amazing comic. Um, those that actually have never seen How to Cat, how would you describe How to Cat for those that don't follow it? OK, so how How to Cat is a semi autobiographical comic about when my family adopted this rescue cat and now i i did not grow up with cats and actually i didn't get my first cat until i was married um so i think 24 <laughs> don't tell my wife i can't remember the, the how old i was but she she grew up with cats so when we started dating she introduced me to cats and i like everybody else in the world who doesn't know cats was just shocked i'm like what is it doing she's like oh that's normal and i'm like why is it clucking at the birds sitting outside she's like oh, they do that that's funny so a lot of the humor i take uh, that i that i found over the years i incorporate into the comic to try to to I, I aim it for people who have cats but i also make sure that it's written in a way to where if you don't have a cat you can find humor in it because like i said i went from somebody who never knew anything about cats to marrying somebody who had two cats and she grew up with cats to, I think this is our third cat. Now the, the other two have passed on, but uh, um, 
I try to, because cats are so funny and believe it or not, the internet loves cats. I don't know if you're aware of that, but they do. The internet loves cats and it, they're so easy to write for because they're so, I think why cats are so funny is because they seem so earnest in what they're doing. As bizarre as it is, it's always like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And and you're just going to sit there and watch, you know, <laughs> and just the whole concept of, you know, uh, you know, a, a cat will will literally crap in a place in your house. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or yeah. not, but he'll, he'll go to the bathroom. He or she will go to the bathroom somewhere in your house, and then you have to clean it up while the cat watches you clean it up. And then once you're done cleaning it up, the cat goes right back in there and fills mm -hmm. that box again. Yeah. That kind of stuff is universally funny. So when I started, it was in between projects, in between uh, projects, Dream Jumper and Steve L. McEvil. I needed something to uh, to occupy my time. So I was just drawing funny situations with our rescue cat. And my wife, uh, she was like, why don't you throw that up on the internet? And I'm like, why? I'm like, this is just, you know, jokes for us to laugh at. And she's like, they're really funny. You should put them up on the internet and see what happens. And I did. I put them up on my social media feeds because I, you know, I, I, I've i done the website thing and I'm like, ah, I, you know, I really don't want to do that. I'll just put it up on social media. But social media was the right thing to do because it just exploded and it was everywhere. And I mean, there's, if you go on Facebook, you'll, you'll find it in, on some obscure rescue site uh, in the middle of Florida somewhere that's like a, a little a rescue hospital will post it on their Facebook page and it'll go viral. And then my phone blows up. And then, you know, the next week, someplace in Iowa does the same thing and my phone blows up. And it's, it's been this incredible ride because obviously McEvil is, is, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my big project that I'm doing right now, but how to cat literally just keeps going and going and going, even if I'm not currently working on it, which it's taken a back seat for McEvil so I can finish McEvil. And then I get back to how to cat probably in a week or two. Um, it just keeps going. I mean, every week I, my phone blows up, Hey, your comics gone viral, your comics gone viral. And it's like, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing that people have just really found something relatable in this comic and i'm so grateful for that i mean it's it's been such an amazing ride with that comic because you know it really deserves so much more of my attention than i'm able to give it and i'm hoping that with 2024 i can really just dive deep into the how-to cat universe and really get it going because it's such a fun comic and all i have to do is sit down and watch my cat for an hour and i've got like a week's worth of material you know it's it, it's never ending. Oh. Well, what's the craziest thing that your your cats have done that you're like, how, why, how are you still alive? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, okay. Th a couple of stories. The first two cats that I had when my wife and I got married, uh, we, what we would do is if my wife and I went out of town, we would take the cats to her mother's house because her mother is also a very uh, big cat person at that time. And but they're indoor cats. They would never go outside. And one time, the 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 cats were brothers, and the younger brother, uh, he was almost he wasn't feral, but he was very kind of skittish. Mm -hmm. And one time he got outside, and unbeknownst to all of us, and but he knew that he was not allowed to go outside. So what he did was is he got outside and he sat on the windowsill of my uh, mother in law's kitchen, looking in. <laughs> panicking because it knew it, it wanted to be outside but it knew it wasn't supposed to be outside so he was trying to get back in through the kitchen window he was just kind of sitting there like this and we had no like i said we didn't know until finally we just hear this the scratching and we all look over and we're like oh, what in the heck is this how did you get out you know and it's amazing to that, that was one of the funnier things that that cat did the other thing that the, the current cat that the comic is based on when we brought her home, she was, uh, her story is kind of sad. She was one of these cats who uh, was raised in a troubled home, was put into a shelter, was adopted out. But the woman who adopted her, her job changed and she had to travel and she couldn't be with the cat for like eight months out of the year. So she brought it back to the shelter. So the cat was used to being, you know, yeah, ping ponged around. And when we got the, when we went in to look at the cats, she was the older cat. Everybody wanted the kittens. And I saw her in the corner and I, I was like, 
that that cat is so sad we got no, that's the one you know it's an older cat you know let's let's bring her home and so when we got when we brought her home she just disappeared she disappeared for a day and my kids at the time were like whoa i don't understand why doesn't she love us i said it, you know it takes time it takes time and then the next day she goes absolutely nuts around the house she just runs around the house like crazy she's she's knocking stuff over and then at one point she like the flash goes up the wall <laughs> on the curtains, just shimmies up the wall and then sits up on top of the curtain rod. And my wife and I are just like, what is this? You know, like I've never seen a cat do that. And, and my wife just says, yeah, they all do their own weird things. And it's funny. She's like, just write it down. <laughs> so I did. And uh, I'm just amazed that the acrobatics that this particular cat has, has not, really injured her because she's one of these cats where she will literally jump three feet in the air when she wants to play she'll wow. jump and then she'll kind of do this weird thing where she's kind of like floating like michael jordan for yeah. anybody who remembers watching jordan back in the 90s where he would jump and it was almost like he was floating she does that and every time i want to get it on tape you know she won't do it one of these days i will i'll, I'll go record it on my phone and i'll post it online so people see like oh my gosh that cat does float and then she'll take off and she'll run or she'll hit the wall. And it's like, how are you not injured? How are you not hurt? She's fine. <laughs> so oh. I would say that very long story would be that. Nice. I, I love it. That's that's awesome. <laughs> we used to have um, Manx cats, actually, little short stubby tails. They'd hop around like rabbits. So it was uh, just hilarious. <laughs> hilarious just to watch them hop like rabbits. And, and it was oh, absolutely. Just, uh, amazing. And uh, all right. So my last five questions here, and thanks so much for your time. I know you're you're rather busy, so we'll, we'll jump right into it. Uh, these are the introspective questions for the documentary I'll eventually put together, A Little Person Amongst Media Giants. It's a 12-year-plus project that eventually I will do. I just need time, like <laughs> everything else in life. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. George Lucas. What he did with the original Star Wars movies absolutely just changed the way I see things creatively and visually. And it, it absolutely put me where I'm at now. Underrated Star Wars character, real quick. <laughs> oh, hmm. Underrated Star Wars character. Oh, you're really putting me on the spot here. Oh, because it's funny because we talk about Star Wars characters in my house every single day because my kids love Star Wars nice. too. Underrated Star Wars character. I'm going to stick with the original trilogy here. Mm -hmm. So, um, hmm. Ooh, underrated Star Wars character. Underrated Star Wars character. Ooh, I'm going to say at the time, Mon Mothma, I mm -hmm. thought was kind of underrated because when that when she appeared on screen in return of the jedi it it kind of it was like almost an interesting glimpse into how like because i believe she was a senator yeah at the, in that movie i don't remember what what her what her rank was but it was like this interesting element that outside of princess leia there were these other elements who were fighting against the empire and i thought that that was fascinating and she was only in the movie for i think like 30 seconds yeah. of the original trilogy and obviously now they realize how important she was because she's in everything that disney does but yeah i'm gonna say mon mothma all right just yeah i was curious about that you know a true star wars fan will have at least one underrated character in their in their back pocket yeah so from a professional standpoint, obviously, you've been making comics for many years with, of course, Imagine This, Steve Val McKeevo, How To Cat, and, of course, Bex, sorry, I, I totally blanked on it. Wow. No worries, yeah. Dream Jumper. Dream Jumper, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we weren't talking about it, really. It's just like, it is what it is. So professionally, you're, uh, su yeah. <laughs> so professionally, you're successful in many different regards. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Personally successful? Yes. Yeah. Well, obviously, um, in, are you talking my view in my professional life or in my personal life? It depends on how you feel I, I would, in that respect. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm answering the question correctly because I, I always go back on these interviews and I always look, I'm like, why did I answer that question like that? That was so ignorant of me. <laughs> but I'm going to say, I I don't think that 
anybody who does anything professionally ever gets to where they think that they should be. So obviously I'm very happy with the work that I've done. Um, but I'm not where I want to be in terms of professionally. I want to be, I want to be in the stratosphere. I want to be like Jeff Kinney, you know, I want to be like, uh, um, uh, Dave Pilkey, you know, or Lincoln purse. I want to be, I want to have Steve, L. McKee will be a household name or how to cat be a, more of a household name, you know? And um, so I think that the problem is, is, is I, I think that that's just like a humanity issue. It's like, you know, once you get to where you've set your goal, you realize, well, no, I, I got to get over here and I have to get over here. I have to get over here. So I think people in general are just never satisfied um, with anything really. So I, I'm going to say that professionally, I'm extremely happy with everything that I've done, but I'm not where I want to be. And I'm going to keep working until I get there. If I ever get there, I doubt it because like I said, we're always kind of moving the goalpost. So um, I am happy with, with everything that I've done. I just, I, I want to be further along and I will get there eventually. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? you learn from them. Um, I learned early on that failure, especially in this industry is very common, extremely common. And if you let it get to you, you will never, you will never create. Um, I had uh, shortly out of college in the early two thousands, I had projects that I thought were going to be the next Calvin and Hobbes, or I thought was going to be the next peanuts that absolutely failed, absolutely failed. And a friend of mine, a local Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist named Steve Breen gave me this advice shortly after college. He said, keep moving forward. Don't stop. Don't take it personally. Just keep going. Something will hit eventually, which will lead to something else, which will lead to something else and so on. So as long as you learn why something failed as long as you can take something from that failure and apply it to something else moving forward it's actually a win and um the one thing that that a lot uh, some other things that that people who fail at kind of miss is is they'll maybe double down on something that failed that's not always the best policy either so maybe take elements of why this failed, kind of maybe push it aside, work on something else, and then come back to this thing in a few years when you've learned more about how you can fix it. And maybe it was a good idea. I just needed a couple of little things that you didn't know how to do at the time. So the most important thing is just learning and moving forward. That is the critical thing with failure. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired but creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or an artist. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking at your work, maybe you're inspiring them to be creative in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Wow. Um, well, the, the thing that I do with my own kids... Um, is that I just show them that you have, like I was just saying with failure, you have to keep moving forward. You, you, you can't get hung up on the idea because a lot of times failure can paralyze somebody. So the best example I can set for my kids is to just keep moving forward, to keep working. Even if, you know, you know, this, this year personally for me, it was very, very difficult for many reasons. But one thing I tried to keep doing was putting the one foot in front of the other and just, just keep going and and using that as inspiration to say, look, you know, you can't let this thing keep you down. You have to keep going forward because that's what life is. You, you have to keep going to get to the finish line. And I think that I hope that that not only my children, but but schools that I visit will see that when they hear my talks. It's like you just have to, you know, just because this idea failed doesn't mean that this idea is going to fail and just keep, you know, you just keep working. You just keep getting at it. If this is truly your dream, if this is truly what you want to do, you know, be prepared for the rejection, be prepared for the failures and just keep going. If your yeah. life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? <laughs> 
Oh gosh, my comic. My comic would be called Sleep Man, and it would be about a person like myself who is constantly working. And every time he tries to get a moments of moment of rest, he's called to another thing. And it just never stops. He never finds sleep. There's always, it's not an exciting comic. It's actually a very sad comic. And then at the very end, he never achieves sleep. So like, you know how Charlie Brown was never able to kick the football? Sleep man never, ever finds sleep. So, and that's a very uh, accurate representation of my life currently. (laughs) I think maybe last night I got two hours of sleep. (laughs) Uh, I'm looking forward to the days when I can kick it back to six hours of sleep. So my soundtrack would have to be something kind of slow, jazzy, with a like a like a saxophone in the distance, very kind of reminiscent of of the early Simpsons, where Lisa would get sad when Bleeding Gums and Murphy would die, and there would be you know some sad slow jazz music in the background. That would be my soundtrack for that comic and for that story. And uh, and it would it would make a lot of parents, it would make a lot of kids sad, and a lot of parents would be like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, very accurate." <laughs> oh, love it. Well, Lucas, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, whenever I can uh, get out in the real world and talk to people, it's always a pleasure because an artist is always tends to be kind of just in their own little universe here. As you can see, I'm in my little room and I probably won't leave here for about four or five hours. So this was wonderful. Thank you so much. For those that want to support you and find you online, where can we find you and everything along that section? Well, um, the best place to find me is social media. So I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook threads. I just got on, uh, what is it? Blue sky. And it's at Lucas Termloom, my name. Um, or you can support uh, How To Cat at patreon.com slash how to cat. Um, and if you're if you're interested, uh, you know, all my books are available on Amazon. Um, and then Steve L. McEvil has a website, uh, Steve L. McEvil.com. And exclusive breaking news, Steve L. McEvil will be a webcomic in the year 2024. So you'll be able to get it five days a week in between books two and book three, which comes out either at the end of next year or the beginning of 2025. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. The podcast is at twogeekstalking.podbean.com, but you can search for Two Geeks Talking, T-W-O, on any area you get your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking